Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Lunch will be in just over one hour. And we have four very distinguished members of the European community to invite on stage in just a moment. The point I would like to drive home is that, as I say, there has been very evident evidence of change and attitude within member countries of the European Union, within the populations of those countries of the European Union. And we were reflecting an hour or two ago about the end of the First World War, 1918. And between 1918 and 1939, when of course the Second World War began, there was a rise of fascism. There was a rise of populism brought about by some of this fascism. And we are seeing very much the same sort of thing in a number of countries, in a number of populations these days. Is it a failed project? Does it need to learn? Do we need to listen to the lessons of the past and of the people who are speaking throughout Europe? Well, those are some of the issues that we will discuss. I was particularly moved this morning by the picture of the young Syrian boy with what looked like flowers, of course, uh, demolished building dust and blood on his face. And we've seen the picture many, many times as a still. To see it as a moving picture for me was extraordinary because he was looking into that camera lens and saying, I need help. And he perhaps was directing that at the person taking the picture. Why aren't you helping me? But it is a broader question. And one that if we're talking about European cooperation, not only within its member states, but also outside in the broader picture is worth debating today. I'm going to invite my guests for this panel up onto the stage one by one. And I'm very pleased to say that first of all, I can introduce Ivo Josipovic, the former president of Croatia. Mr. President. Jolly good to see you. Thank you very Thank much you. for Mission coming. Messi. Please take that one. Okay. Can I invite Volkan Bozka, former Minister of EU Affairs of Turkey, to come to the stage? Stefan, hang on a second. One second. Mr. Fredini, wait. Please. Sit down, Mr. Bozka. Very nice to see very you. Nice take your seat you. here. Stefan Fuhr, former European Commissioner for Enlargement and what is known as the European Neighbourhood Policy. And Franco Frattini, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy. Distinguished panel, thank you very much indeed. Italy, of course, facing, um, well, a populist government, if you like, at the moment. Not necessarily facing, but having elected a populist government. That is one of the things that we will come to talk about. Um, I think the way we're going to start is reflecting on things that have changed in the last, let's say, eight years. I'm going to ask each speaker to give their thoughts, and then we will examine those thoughts, either on a one-to-one -one basis with me asking some questions, or in fact, reflections from the panel and questions to each one of you as well. It's very, very informal. So, Mr. President, Mr. Yotopoulos, let me, let me ask you all, first of all, if you go back to the time of the Balkan conflict, how much did the European project help, perhaps hinder, and where has it gone since then in terms of your country? As it's well known, the uh, European Union is primarily a peace project. I have to admit that uh, in Croatia, we uh, expected more from the EU to stop the war. Uh, but after the war, uh, definitely uh, EU was considered not only in Croatia, but in Europe and the other countries as well, as a tool how to make the region peaceful. And uh, in, even in 1999, there was first step, some kind of permission to states of former Yugoslavia to become, to become a member of EU. Uh, Slovenia was the first, but Slovenia didn't have serious war. And now uh, th th there will be soon anniversary of my highlight of my political career. That was the very day when Prime Minister Kosar and myself uh, signed the accession treaty on uh, 9th of December uh, 2011. So Croatia became a uh, full member on 1st of July 2013. And we have 
uh, really important expectation. Uh, what, what, does, what did it bring to Croatia? Our, our uh, process was very long for us. Uh, at the very, time, uh, very same time when I entered the office of the president, Mr. Stefan Fühle was uh, commissioner for enlargement. And from time to time, we considered him as a state enemy because he was always pushing with new conditions and so on and so on. But I have to admit, Croatia became better society during the process. We had problems with corruption, we had problems with responsibility for war crimes, minority problems, and we still have problems with border with other, our, with other neighbors, namely Serbia, Slovenia, Montenegro, but it's peaceful. No one is uh, putting this topic as what, hot one. Was that, those problems you talk about, the, the neighborhood problems, um, were they something that the European Union could have done anything about? Yeah, uh, I think it was very important, this type of pressure from EU side uh, to resolve some of uh, burning issues, especially it is uh, responsibility for war crimes and uh, cooperation with the ICTY, that's the first thing. And secondly, uh, after the war, uh, Croatia has uh, a relatively huge Serbian minority, it was very important to establish fair condition for the, the minority in Croatia, to um, be inclusive, to ensure their participation in our uh, social, civil and political life. And that was very, very important. And the, 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 the third very important issue was corruption. Uh, unfortunately, in all this region, corruption was very developed, even uh, because it was motivated by the war and war circumstances. And uh, so we were considered as a country exposed to corruption. And uh, during this period, we did quite a lot of legislative and practical thing how to fight corruption. Which is where I would imagine, and Mr. Boske, I will come to you in just a moment, specifically relating to Turkey. Do jump in at any moment. We started on the very same day, our negotiations. <laughs> yeah, ah, Turkey and Croatia yeah. started Well, started I suppose that's an interesting point, isn't it? How far have Turkey's got? But can I come to you in, in, in just a moment on that? Mr. Fuller, and please, Mr. Frattini as well, do jump in, interject, say any time, anything you want at any time. Let me ask you, you talk about corruption. Yeah. Yep. It is one of the pillars of joining the European Union that a country has gone as far as it can in trying to stamp out corruption. And yet we saw the European Union desperate to get Greece involved. And the corruption in that country at the time was such that the European Union really didn't even look at the Greek bank sheet, and we saw where that went. Is it a case of saying one thing and doing another? Listen, the corruption is not, of course, only the issue for those uh, who want to get in. This is also the issue for those who are uh, already there. Uh, one of the important things is uh, uh, no double standards. Uh, so whatever we require of the candidate countries, uh, of course, is required uh, 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 from the member states. The issue with Greece was a little bit more complicated. It was not only the corruption. It, it adds up to the problems uh, we, we faced. And that's why also the reaction from the EU institution was much more complex than addressing just one single issue. Please, Mr. President, do carry on. This is your particular time uh, on the so, microphone, so please respond. Okay, so uh, corruption. Uh, I consider the main, main source of corruption, firstly, uh, war conditions, because during the war institution were not functioning, it allowed uh, people especially connected to the power, to military, to right. some uh, political structure, to misuse position. But uh, that was not the, the only issue. We really did quite a lot to fight corruption. Special legislation, even prime minister was arrested. So we did, uh, I think, relatively good job. But uh, I was frequently uh, visited by ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of justice for EU countries, uh, s somehow always claiming about com corruption. And then uh, I put on the table the final argument. Yes, we still have corruption, but let's see who is giving bribe. We had so many cases that 
bribe was coming from EU countries. And those countries were not willing to prosecute those uh, old citizens for corruption. But is it the same as I've just uh, pointed out? It, 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 it's one thing said in public and another thing done in yeah. behind closed doors. Yeah. And finally, then, in one moment, the uh, European Union said, yes, Croatia is ready. And uh, we really, I really consider that we became not a perfect country, far from it, but much better so society, not country, than before. And uh, then uh, what, what happened? On the 1st of July 2013, we had a big celebration on the main square in Zagreb, and it lasted for some period. But then we experienced something very important, and it will be important for our uh, neighbors coming in future to EU. Uh, reforms are never finished. So we have to uh, continue reforms to not only to adapt uh, to, to EU regulation, it's changing every day, but to continue changing our society. And in that period, it lasted very good for, for a year or two, and unfortunately, I have to say that uh, today we have some kind of social regression and need to continue reforms and to be back on the track of European reforms. I'm going to ask you two questions, one of which I would like you to ponder on and the rest of you to do the same towards the end of the program. I'm going to ask you specifically what things about the European Union or one particular thing about the European Union that you would like to change. But let me ask you this before we move on to Mr. Boska. Let, let me ask you, is it possible to have a one-size-fits-all membership of a club that involves, as you say, so many different society, so many different peoples and so many different <coughs> aspirations. It's a long-term process. I think uh, now the uh, European Union is on borderline and it has to make decision whether we are going to have more or less Europe. Uh, that means more powers, more responsibility, more common activities. And I think this uh, approach, more Europe, is going to make European as a uh, good project for future. If we continue with philosophy, less Europe, I don't know what will be the future. That's the, the, the important reason. So uh, what's also very important, uh, if I were president of European Commission, I will immediately start to work on building European identity. I think we don't have enough European identity. But it, that's my point. Is there such a thing as a European identity when we have the people in the south of Italy, when we have the people yeah, in Croatia? Yeah, but being German. Croatian does not mean that I don't feel European. Can you imagine a world championship in football with European team as well? That will be my second favorite <laughs> after Croatia. <laughs> Mr. Boski, and by the way, congratulations on the World Cup. Um, Mr. Boki, let me ask you two things. One, you are now chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the, the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, but I'm going to try and get this right. You were previously um, former Minister of EU Affairs of Turkey, which brings us to the present and also the past. And I think you were saying, Mr. President, that you two, two countries started negotiations on the same day. Look where Croatia's gone. Why is Turkey where it is today? Well, I think uh, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the first application to the European entity. So uh, I think uh, we, we shouldn't start with where we started negotiations with Croatia, but it shows uh, how stubborn, how decided, how tolerant and how patient Turkey is to maintain this relation. But it is not just becoming a member to an organization. The European Union is more than becoming a member to the UN or to NATO or whatever. It brings uh, a style to your life. It is in your everyday life. And it really uh, improves uh, the standards uh, of, of, of people in every uh, issue the chapters are covering. So because of that, we still want to become member and we still want the continuation of the process. But the may, may I just yeah. ask you to pause for a second and bring in Mr. Frattini on the far end. Uh, it improves every aspect of every person's life, the European Union. Do you think the people of Italy, having voted in a right-wing populist government and effectively um, raised a finger, if you like, to the European Union, um, feel the same? Uh, well, um, I think we, we used to make some mistakes by 
uh, taking for granted all the extremely important achievements Europe had in the past years, I make just three examples on the security. It is thanks to Europe that I, as Italian judge, can take a terrorist arrested in the Netherlands after three weeks in Rome without any kind of rogatory procedure. Secondly, it is thanks to Europe that can I freely move from Portugal to Vilnius without being controlled at the borders with my car. Thirdly, it is thanks to Europe that I have a roaming system throughout Europe without paying huge amount of money as it was in the past. People tend to take for granted. That said, there is a reason why Italians were uh, dissatisfied with the functioning of Europe as it is today, because uh, we see uh, a huge gap between the European Brussels narrative. Everything is okay. Everything is going okay. You are uh, to be blamed because of national mistakes while Europe is always right. And the reality. Reality in my country is the reality of the country that used to be the most pro-European pro country. At a certain moment, we felt to be left alone vis-a-vis -vis migration crisis, to be left alone vis-a-vis -vis need to get out of the tunnel of the crisis because uh, some German-led austerity fiscal policies denying any kind of investment. So austerity versus growth, immigration versus isolation. This was the route leading Italian voters to vote for those that are reluctant vis-a-vis. -vis Thank aid. you. I'm going to come back to you, uh, Mr. Boschier, and, and ask you to comment on what you've just heard, but also particularly uh, when we're talking about the refugee, the migrant problem, uh, whether, whether Turkey feels it has been helped or let down by the European Union in this case, because we're talking three and a half million refugees here. I know some money has come from the European Union, perhaps not all that was promised. Well, our problem is uh, we don't have any difficulty to work together with the European Union, which is in a, on an issue which is considered as a threat to peace and stability to everyday life. And this unforeseen uh, I illegal migration flow was actually uh, something nobody was expecting. We were uh, threatened by every day 5,000 uh, illegal immigrants uh, flying or uh, going to uh, Greece, Greek islands, then to Europe. But at that moment, we really did well. Uh, we had great cooperation. We really uh, saw many political leaders coming to Turkey more than ever. For example, President Barroso came uh, to Turkey three times in eight years, while during that period when we were facing a difficulty with migrants, we saw the President of the Commission, President of the Council, the German uh, ch Chancellery coming five times in eight years. And, and what have you got out of that? What have, you, what have you been given by the European Union? I mean, they're so, all very well for them to come and pay a visit this is, and to promise uh, some money. This but, is but not what, what help? Money. You haven't got membership. They haven't. Money, money is not important. For the migrants in Turkey, we have spent more than $30 billion. And what we discussed with the European Union was in two packages, uh, 3 billion euros, one and a half, one and a half. But almost one third of it uh, arrived in Turkey because it comes through international organization schemes where almost 20% is lost on the road also. But the problem is not the money here. It is solidarity. To see that we are with the European Union in difficult times and the European Union is with us in our difficult times. And, and is that the case? Let me put that to, to Stefan Fuhr because neighborhood enlargement, neighborhood policy and um, commissioner for en enlargement. Um, you can talk to people, you can be as neighborly as you like, but if you don't offer any real practical steps, what's that worth? I think the solidarity uh, 
and engagement is on the long list of the challenges uh, the European Union has to uh, address among uh, its own member states and between the EU uh, and its, uh, its neighbourhood. Uh, can I come to the sort of two basic questions, and you yourself ask uh, about the basic question. You, you ask whether one size fits all. Uh, I think this is, this is a crucial question ahead of the European uh, Union, and it's going to define how you, how you answer this question. It defines whether the European Union will be some kind of uh, closed club uh, uh, behind the fence, or whether it will be an inclusive uh, uh, club where you have the various uh, uh, level of, of engagement and cooperation with those who find uh, the rules in this club attractive. Because uh, uh, it's for the number of the countries, and I, and I guess also for Turkey, that most of those rules you find attractive, some of them uh, uh, not maybe in the future. But what does it mean? Does it imply that you will be pushed away for all those years uh, uh, and uh, the engagement will be up to some kind of ad hoc arrangement of high-level dialogue? I don't think so. But, but isn't I, I, that what um, Mr. Fertini is, is, is suggesting, is that the people or certain people in Italy of a voting age and perhaps of a certain age feel that Brussels is dictating and saying this is the way we do it. This is our club, these are our rules, and they don't like being patronised in that way. I, I think what has happened is that in European project, uh, because it's uh, very much about the norms, rules and so on, this becomes so complicated and so technical that people just let the politicians to play their games in Brussels, to build the institutions and so on. When the life was good, when the prosperity uh, was there, people flourished uh, and so on, the people did not ask the politicians, you know, to, 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 to be responsible for certain steps. They didn't ask how you actually, how you actually, what you actually do in Brussels. The situation changed. We have realized we don't have real like, crisis management uh, in the European Union. All the crises we are prepared for are the crises we already sort of went through. And it is in, in this environment that people sort of are fed up because, you know, the basic instinct of politician, if something happens, is what? To go to Brussels, to work with other behind the table? Unfortunately not. The base political instinct for European politicians is to go to your constituency, to your state, you know, to make sure that once you elected, that you elected also for the second time and so on, you're trying to find a national solution to a supranational uh, issue. You find out later on, sooner or later, unfortunately on many occasions later on, that you cannot find the solution which will not be at the expense of your neighbors, of your allies in NATO in the EU. So you come to the Brussels again but unfortunately, the issue uh, at stake, I, an issue I, in your hands, much bigger. I have a question, but I will keep it to myself for just a moment because you want to jump in, Mr. Bosco. Yeah, if I may, uh, just to of add course. what Stefan is saying. Actually, the attraction for the European uh, Union or whatever it was replaced the American dream uh, in the 50s. Uh, people dressed like the Americans, listened to American music because it was prosperity and everything what wasn't existing elsewhere was in the United States, the American dream. But Europe came with a different concept, with values and, uh, and uh, really important uh, attraction for all the people in the world to become more rich, more prosperous and enjoy this uh, wonderful fundamentals. Perhaps we but, should have left it but, as a European economic area rather than a political but, dream then. But the, this is uh, the vision. Visionary projects uh, actually added to the foundation of the, of the entity. Projects like Euro, projects like Schengen, projects like making it a political entity from European economic community to European Union. No. But then came the problem. When things are good, 
the attraction is there. But when Europe faced with a new situation where new countries <coughs> were added to the six, became a con a, an entity of 28, the decision-making process became very difficult. So decisions were either late or wasn't there when, when they were needed. Hands are going up all over the place. I will come to that end of the, the stage in just a moment. But Mr. President, you wanted to say something first? Yes. So uh, I think that the European Union, if we want to have European Union to be capable to compete with the United States, especially in new conditions with President Trump's new doctrine, America first, if we want to be equal partner to Russia, to China, then the European Union uh, should have a clear uh, consistency in some values and some rules. Uh, and decision-making process should be uh, of quality to ensure that Europe can appear on the scene. If we do not this, then we are talking club. I think it's not possible to have a carte blanche and every state will pick up What's uh, sympathy with sympathy? What they need? I think we should have a new political structure in European Union, making all countries and societies to participate in decision-making process. But when decision is taken, then we have to obey. Without this, European Union has not future. So I think that we need more future, more Europe, not less may, Europe. May I move on to something which is at the, the very heart of the European question, if you like, at the moment? and that is the euro itself and countries with, with massive debt. And Mr. Frattini, if I could ask you to be the spokesman for Italy in this, as I address this question to, to, to Stefan Fuhr, you said, uh, maybe I got this slightly wrong, but I think you said a couple of minutes ago that you don't believe the European Union plans for the next crisis properly. Now, when Greece had problems with its economy, it was manageable, just about. It is a small country economically compared to so many others. When you look at the scale of the debt in Italy and the problems that there and the rise of populism in, in that country, that is of, on an entirely different scale. What, what do you do? I mean, th this is a hopeless situation to be in, isn't it? Just hoping that the dam doesn't break. Well, um, let's talk for one second about Greece. I remember at the very beginning of the terrible economic crisis in Greece, there were those in Europe saying, OK, at the end, it would be not a nightmare if Greece is left to go to its destiny. I found such as phrases and principle terrible, not be only because of Greece, but because of the message. In Italy, such as message, and in other states, was taken as the principle Europe is refusing to protect the interest of its member states while talking about how to manage in uh, cooperation another potential crisis. If I think there could be a repetition of a situation like in Greece aggravated by the dimension of other states, I'm very concerned. So when I see people saying we need more Europe, I agree. We need more Europe, but more political Europe. We need to resume the dream of our founding fathers, who was a political project, security and defense, common policy, commonly managing economic governance. May, may I All what is ask that? you this then? If, if it was, in your opinion, the dream of the Founding Fathers to have a political and democratically united yeah. Europe, were a great many people lied to, or do they feel like they've been lied to, because it did start off simply as an economic area, European economic community, a trading area. Yeah. And yet there were those, you say, who all along wanted it to be something more almost federal. Yeah, this is a possibility. There is possibility Europe remains as a purely economic space of cooperation. We will see what happens with Brexit, because uh, Brexit could easily aggravate the current situation also on the European common market. I'm convinced we need a vision which is more ambitious 
that a purely economic common space. We need to go beyond towards common foreign policy, common security policy. Otherwise, we keep Europe as incomplete project. We have a common but, but I'm suggesting is that people are now hearing you and you're saying that this was what yeah. was planned all along. But they are saying, I'm sorry, we didn't buy into that. We didn't vote for that. And that is one reason why we're electing uh, right-wing populist governments in Italy. It's one reason why the, the, the British have decided to vote to leave. It was a lie all along. And I will come to the other panelists in just a moment. Let me get this from Mr. Frattini. Yes, it, it is not a paradox, but those that voted for the far right in Italy, if you would propose Europe ready to engage tomorrow on better protection on terrorism, showing more solidarity vis-a-vis -vis immigration, getting more integration on common European infrastructure, they would say, okay, this new kind of Europe is persuading all those that seem to be reluctant. The problem is that Europe is not responding to the request of those that want more protection, more guarantees, more security, less illegal immigration. This is the problem of Europe today. Everybody wants to say something. It's, yeah. it's, I have to make a choice. And Stefan, I, I did mention you before we went to Mr. Frattini there. Um, are you saying that Europe is unprepared for something that could go calamitously wrong? Let's say with the Italian economy, where, where there is so much debt, that there is no easy way out. No, I think they are much better prepared uh, than uh, uh, we were uh, when the Greek problem uh, um, has uh, risen. Uh, is this because time, of stress that, tests with the banks, etc.? Uh, exactly. At that time, there was there was no book coming to follow, and I and I remember. But actually, when I was at the, the Commission, we, we indeed sort of uh, were addressed the basic question whether the Greece will remain in the Eurozone, whether it will remain in, in, in the European Union and what, what, what it means. I mean, look, uh, look uh, at Greece uh, today. It's about to be out of that, uh, uh, of that program. Uh, uh, they face a difficult time. Uh, but they have the wars uh, uh, behind them. And are you saying the same we have, with the Spanish? And we, and we have established the full mechanism in that, that something what we faced in Greece does not happen to, in any other country. And, and what about Spain? I mean, youth unemployment there is absolutely astronomical. There is discontent in that country. There's talk of separation not only within Spain itself, but um, movements which actually want to withdraw from the European Union. There is discontent in these countries. You may have staved off the problem for now. Oh. Listen, discontent uh, is one of the reasons why the European Union uh, is evolving uh, continuously. When we applied for the UN membership, the Czech Republic uh, I'm talking about, uh, they told us, guys, be prepared because the European Union going to join will be different than the one you now sort of applying for the membership uh, to, and it was true. And I can imagine, I mean, my, my Turkish friends, uh, how they feel when they applied, I mean, so many years ago, and looking at the Europe, uh, European Union uh, uh, today. And that's why I'm, I'm saying, and I don't see any contradiction in uh, what Mr. President and, and Franco was saying about more Europe. I'm also for more Europe but not necessarily through one size fits all. I can imagine that there is a group of the countries within the European Union which go deeper and faster. Yeah. Of course, on the basis of certain rules, transparency, inclusivity, that they could be joined later on by, by others uh, who will be okay. uh, prepared at that, at that time. And that we create a number of the orbits uh, yeah. and the rules how you will be engaged with the European Union, but not... The, 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 the problem with that, is, which is what you're, you're talking about, a two-speed Europe, to some extent, it, it, is that it's also referred to as a first-class and a second-class no. Europe. I'm, I'm going to come to you in just a moment, Mr. President, yes, if that, I may, but... That will, be, that will be a disaster, in my point of view, because if you separate... Well, tell Stefan why you think it's a disaster. Why? Because if you say there are some countries uh, superior some countries less developed, then you will be 
in difficulty naming which country is in the first circle, which country is in the second circle. Some countries will protest because they are not in the first, first circle. This is, not a, this is an old idea. It was spelled uh, many years uh, ago. But the problem is, when we were talking about Greece uh, and Spain, you have mentioned, there is a laboratory test where you have different uh, shaped tubes attached together. The water level or the liquid level is always the same. So the mistake was thinking that Greece is a small country, so it, it will not harm the euro. Everybody knew that euro, entering into euro, Greece wasn't prepared. The, the figures were not exactly correct. So actually, this tube, one of the tube, uh, cracked and the liquid went out. So that is the threat on the euro system. But the decision doesn't come. So Germany benefited from the economic crisis and became a political uh, leader of the European Union. And many countries are not happy with that. Can I go back to Stefan? Because you, you're shaking your head as if I'd misrepresented you. I, I apologize uh, if I did. Uh, listen, my country uh, does not accept uh, euro or, or, or does not use euro, uh, at least not yet. Uh, I don't feel I'm a second class citizen of the European uh, uh, Union. I think the point is. It's not just the euro. The point, no, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. The point is that already today you have a number of the policies where not all but only some of the EU members uh, uh, are part of. The, the issue is, the main principle, this is your decision, it is your ambition, it is, it is your political decisions whether you want to be in that core group or not, whether you will remain in, in, in the orbit number one or two or whether you will use those orbits sooner or later to get to the core group. And, and if you apply that principle, then, it, then it's fine. Mr. President, I have to come so, to you because I know that you and I are sitting down for an interview in about an hour and a half's time and I have to make sure you want to turn up. Yeah, no. So I'm going to ask you uh, in a second think, what you uh, think uh, about the second class. Very, very voting, very, very voting on our membership. We had 67% of voters for. Today, it's almost the same proportion almost the same proportion. That means, in spite from time to time, we are not satisfied with this or that European decision or approach, uh, we are pro-European country. Uh, I'm not in favor of this babushka system, you know, babushka with several tracks for different... The Russian dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't like it because uh, I think it will uh, generate important political problems and even reluctance in some countries. Uh, I'll prefer a vision that will form clear authorities for Europe for defined and the most important areas of European life. My vision, I don't know in how many years, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, uh, is your, uh, United States of Europe. United States of Europe. I think it's uh, the best future for European Union. We cannot reach it now. Now it's probably utopia for different political, economical and the other. In some countries it's a, a dystopia. No, now it's not. We don't have it. Now we have conglomeration of different states. And almost that. But, yeah. but, that, but that's exactly what feeds the populists uh, 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 who have the ammunition to attack the European projects. We sort of, of leads us now round to this point. But of I course, we don't agree. That's it. You cannot convince everyone. But uh, I would like to see national leaders with clear pro-European policy and willingness to participate and to lead, not to follow. If you follow populists and pop, uh, populism in your country, you are following. You are not leader. I think uh, we should somehow to promote leadership on the European level and the national level as but, well. But this is leadership on, on your terms, isn't it? I mean, if you take a look at the, the populace of, of the voting population of, of Hungary, if you take a look at the, um, some of the people in Great Britain who voted, 51% of those who voted, yeah. um, want to follow the, the more populist route, which is to say no to the yeah. European project, and you could the, the, go the on. Biggest, the and, and yet you're saying you want to, if you like, persuade people that this is the right system. How do you go? You about know, that? you cannot go to TV and to have nice speech to change their approach. I think it, what Mr. Frattini said is very important: that European Union has capacity to respond to different crises or to different needs 
in particular area or state. But uh, we need precondition for that. Precondition are efficient, efficient structure. Precondition is uh, change of democra democratic uh, 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 responsibility and democratic status of uh, European bodies. Now they are not considered as democratic because the most important bodies are not worldwide uh, elected. It's generated from the country. <coughs> and finally, uh, we have to, to uh, find uh, uh, criteria. What, uh, what do we uh, consider as the most important uh, and essential for European Union. Not everything. No, we blame, we all, uh, even, even make jokes. What European is prescribing? Size of potato, color of apple, or something like that. We don't need that. We need to ensure the most important <coughs> values. Yeah. The main rules, Greece crisis. Can you imagine what uh, should happen with Greece without European support. So can I ask you therefore? If even if they are not satisfied, but they couldn't, in Greece, they couldn't expect that they should continue having average uh, uh, salary, I don't know, uh, or, or retirement of 1,300 euros, and to uh, keep it in same time having uh, Baltic countries with 300. May I ask you therefore to go back to the question I raised about 35 minutes ago, which is what particular thing would you change about the European uh, Union to ensure its survival and so that it doesn't repeat the mistakes of the past? Can, can I start with you, Mr. Frattini, at the, the far end of the, the stage? Well, um, I would change three things. The most important one, how to reconnect with the normal people with the ordinary people, people in the streets, people that are persuaded, rightly or wrongly, that Europe is dictating everything on their respective daily life. How to reconnect. Uh, well, can, can I ask you whether it's right or wrong? How, how do you do that? Well, if, if people are feeling to be distant from Brussels, Brussels are not taking care of their daily life, they react by voting against Europe. Second change, communication. I've been uh, Vice President of European Commission together with Stefan. Communication from European institution, it is very poor. They are not capable to reach to the people and to make people to understand if people are taking for granted, for example, how Europe, where Europe was saved during the crisis because of the quantitative easing coming from the European Central Bank. People take for granted, but it was not granted before the decision taken by Mario Draghi by the Central Bank. But the communication was poor in a world which is populated by socials that attract billions of followers, how is the communication of Europe? Third thing, we have to explain to people what are the costs of not having Europe. Because the people believe that Europe is dictating. This is imposing that. Please reflect. Okay, I'm going to have to move down because we do have this a... This is a third chance. We do have a time limit and each one of you has a trap door underneath your chair. And if you go on too long, somebody over there will pull yeah. a lever and you, you will simply disappear. Um, Mr. Boschia, well, your I, opinion. Then I'll go back to you, Stefan, because I you've think, been central to the European project I think towards the end. we have to also uh, evaluate what the problems uh, EU is facing. For example, Brexit. I would like to evaluate that as well. I think it hasn't been presented to the British people properly. It was just a referendum, shall we be in or out? And nobody actually uh, understood what they will lose, how much it will cost, and uh, what will be the prospects for, for UK after it has quitted the... Now, the move is... But whose fault was that? Well, I think it is... Is the, it the same as Mr. Fratelli says Europe doesn't explain no, it? No, it's, it's in those days that was the wind blowing. But, you know, in politics, I'm sure UK will stay in the European Union. Brexit will not come to a final solution because the, there will be another wind which, is, which has started to blow 
and there will be a new referendum, people will say, I will stay, because the cost is very costly. The figures were like five, it came out to be like 500. So for tell Europe me what also. happens if that comes to pass, and British people already having voted to leave the European Union, there is then a second referendum uh, because people didn't like the result of the first one. What if people didn't like the result of the second one, would they then vote again? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, that's the people's choice. So you just choice. keep on going and you that's never get... It's the people's choice. You have to obey. And if it is the people's choice, why not just let it happen? There will be another choice of the people <laughs> and the government will change in the UK and you will stay in the, uh, in the this, European this is, this is just politician speaking. Remember isn't what it? I we said We keep today. on going, Mr. <laughs> President, until you get the answer you want. No. Uh, I think it's important to respect the decision of every nation. If Brits are willing to go, let them go. It's their decision, not our decision. But we have to fight for the rest of Europe. And whether they are going to decide to be back, I will be very happy. Great Britain is a very important country. Do you think it's possible that the European Union is making it very difficult for Great Britain to leave because it will see the departure of the UK as the first brick out of the wall of the European project? No, no. I think it's, uh, it must be fair. Uh, no one who is leaving uh, should not make harm to the others because uh, there was their decision to participate in the project and coming in and leaving must be fair for both sides. And now they're negotiating. Okay, that's one issue. But I would like to, to go back to what Mr. Frattini says. He mentioned several things important for future of European Union. I consider it uh, probably the same under name of identity. I am going back to very important issue of identity. Because what does identity mean? Not just to uh, say, okay, I'm Croat and I'm European, but to feel Europe as our natural surrounding, to feel European government as our government as well, and uh, to suppress, I think, something that's now the most, the biggest danger for Southeastern Europe is nationalism. Nationalism is illness that's killing societies from inside and it's killing good international relations. So that will be, for me, that's the most important value and uh, we should fight for it. And just uh, staying and watching what's going on in different countries is not possible. It's irresponsible. Stefan Fuller, let me come to you. You can say what you like first of all, but I go back to the same point, which is that the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union is the first sign of the project, if you want to call it that, the European project, starting to fall apart. And there are reasons why, and that is people feel neglected. I, I, I don't agree. Uh, uh, and uh, what is important from my perspective uh, uh, when it comes to the Brexit was the chance the European Union missed uh, uh, there because the European Union has also a lot to lose uh, uh, from the UK leaving. Uh, uh, I, very recently, I have compared two documents. One was the document we negotiated uh, with at that time Prime Minister Cameroon, uh, 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 which would answer some of the critics, uh, criticism in the, in the UK uh, and would uh, create the conditions for the UK to stay. And then I compare it with Bratislava Declaration, which was uh, uh, adopted uh, only a, a weeks after the uh, referendum uh, on, uh, on, on Brexit. Uh, we're talking about one European Union, but we're talking about two completely different documents. It's, it's about two completely different paths about of the future of the European Union. And I'm afraid that uh, we walk through that crossroad without actually a real reflection. But coming back to your basic question, is it the end of European project? Absolutely not. Buckle up. The, right, the real right is, is only to, uh, uh, to start. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, the size matters. The size matters again, and particularly in the area of globalism. And if you ask me what I would change, number of the things. And but, you have three but, minutes but, to tell but, but, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you only two. The first, uh, uh, I would change my own uh, uh, position on Spitzenkandidaten and making the European Commission more political. That was a mistake. Uh, I participated uh, uh, in it. Uh, I think you cannot have 
commission more political and the same time objective, more objective, uh, neutral, uh, and be, being the, the objective guardian of the treaties uh, and defending the interest also of the smaller countries. So that was that that was one thing I would change. And the second thing I would uh, I would change, um, and I hope it will come with the next Commission and with the next EU institutions, a more engaging abroad. Uh, I'm I'm terrified if I look at the Euro Asian continent. And I look at the European Union, Eurasian Economic Union, and One Belt, One Road. Those are a three integration projects, completely different. I'm not comparing them. I'm not saying sort of they, they equal to each other. Huh? But you have three different systems of the rules of the norms. If we failed to find a certain uh, uh, compatibility among, among those three, three projects, Oh, we will have a new dividing clients in Europe in no time. And look at Ukraine and all that crisis around. Uh, you know, the very reasons was exactly the, the, the kind of relationship and trap we have also helped to create uh, for the shared neighborhood between the European Union on one side, the Eurasian Economic Union on the other side. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we could continue for a very long time. I, d I don't think that would keep too many people um, away from lunch. We could get them to stay here because it's so fascinating. I do a daily program for TRT World called Roundtable. I would like to invite each and every one of you onto the program, either together or separately. Your thoughts have been absolutely fascinating. Uh, there was a round of applause when we started. Let's have a bigger one now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for lunch.